There you go. Okay, get the wave going. Get the wave. Yep. We need one of those giant like balloon balls that can go all around the room. Yeah, we all have glasses of water, so at some point during the talk, we will just be randomly throwing them at you. So get happy about that. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. It's an exciting panel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so you want to be square in the splash zone, right? Is that a seal can? My favorite thing is go to any that shouldn't have a splash zone and just mark out table. There you go. Nice. And then just leave. Okay. And no explanation. Yeah. 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 All right. It is now 11 o'clock, and the first thing on my thing here is please start on oh. time. So we're starting on time, despite these people that are just coming in now. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, Welcome uh, to the Bay Area Book Festival's Building a Literary Community program. Um, please turn off, silence your cell phones. Um, otherwise, I'm going to like literally call you out. Your phone's ringing right there. Um, and that's embarrassing. Uh, I am Lisa Quintana. I am, will be your moderator. And I'm supposed to acknowledge all the sponsors, but that is literally self-serving at this point because Zoetic Press is a sponsor, and I'm the head of Zoetic Press. Thank me. OK. Um, book sales will be going on at the East Wind Books Tent in the park at 1245, so 15 minutes directly after this session. You are going to buy everyone's book and have it signed. You are, OK. Jedi mind trick. Um, and. I am going to let the speakers introduce themselves. I have their bios here, but I feel like they would talk better for themselves. And I'm going to start at your left with Roberto Lobel. Thank you. Uh, Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Roberto Lovato. I'm author of this book. My agent requires me to show everywhere I go. <laughs> um, Unforgetting. Um, it's a memoir about uh, the history of violence and overcoming in the United States and El Salvador and the in, kind of the space between them. And uh, there's a component of it that deals with the construction of literary community that I'll be chairing. Uh, I'm also a journalist and, um, and, and soon to be professor of English at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Thank you. OK, next we have Janice Cook Newman. Hi, um, thank you guys for coming. It's really nice to see so many of you. Um, I'm an author of two novels and a memoir, but for the purposes of this panel, I am the founder of the Lit Camp Writers Conference and also our new co-working space for writers, which just opened up in San Francisco, and also the founder of something called Creative Caffeine Daily, which is an online platform for writers to develop community. Cool. Oh, you guys get to keep that. And directly to the right of me, your right, uh, Grant Faulkner. You, you, you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yeah, I've written a couple collections of short stories and a couple of books about the craft of writing, uh, most notably Pep Talks for Writers. That's the one I wrote personally. And then I teamed with Rebecca Stern to write Brave the Page, which is for teen writers. And uh, those latter two books are largely the product of National Novel Writing Month, which some of you might know as NaNoWriMo. And that's where I'm executive director. And I'm just curious how many people here, has anyone done National Novel Writing Month? OK, good. Good. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's basically, a, we're going to talk about a lot today, but it's really a literary community, even more than an event. And I also run this little literary journal called 100 Word Story, where you have to write every story has to be exactly 100 words. And Hi. our final panelist, I'm so sorry, yeah. Rebecca Phelps. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Phelps. I'm the author of Downworld, which is a young adult sci-fi novel. It is out now from Wattpad Books. The sequels, uh, the first sequel is Yesterworlds. I don't know if you can see it. It's coming out December 6th, and then Everworld is coming next spring. And I'm, uh, these are all out from Wattpad Books, so I'm also kind of here representing Wattpad Books, and I can answer any questions about taking books from Wattpad to published to beyond, 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 beyond. 
Okay, there will be time at the end to answer questions, so if you have questions, just hold on to them. Um, but first, we're gonna be talking about um, writing community. So, you know, you as a writer relating to other writers. So the first thing, and I wanna throw this open to the whole panel, I want this to be a conversation, not a Q&A. Uh, how many different writing communities do you interact with regularly? So not just ones you might run, but also ones that you belong to as a writer. Um, and what functions do they serve for you? Stunts. You know what, I'll go first, because okay. coming from the Wattpad platform, it is a huge community of writers and readers that is literally international. I don't even know how many people interact with Wattpad every day. Lots, millions and millions of people. Um, so there's that one, and because my books originated on Wattpad, I've been lucky enough to really interact with those those people, mostly young people, who've discovered books on that platform and who read and comment and who have a lot to say. So that's been a really fascinating way to get books into the world, just to have this platform where people literally, you post a, a chapter at a time and people in real time comment and say, I love this, I hate that, why is he doing this? It's, it's a weird experience. And uh, to go from that to being traditionally published where you just have an editor, you just have one person giving you notes and you're like, well, where are the hundreds of other people? What do they think of it? Um, so that's been my experience with novel writing is it was incredibly social. It was incredibly interactive. And then traditional publishing, not quite as much. Um, so that's, that's the social platform that I come out of. I, other than that, I think I've discovered other p platforms just on Instagram and Twitter and what have you. I've kind of fallen into those communities, but nothing has ever been the same as how interactive Wattpad was. <laughs> Go for it, Janice. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna tell you about a writer's community that pretty much saved my sanity during the pandemic. So, you know, all those months that I was locked inside my house by myself, um, four other writers who are published writer friends of mine and I met every day online to write together. And I mean, this is something anybody can do with, you know, people that you like and you like their writing. Um, where we would just sign on on Zoom, check in with each other, write silently for 90 minutes, but we could see each other. Um, it came to be a surveillance writing. <laughs> and then when it was done, we would check in and sometimes read for each other, and that was a really, really wonderful thing. It's so good that it's going on still, even though we're now out of our houses. Um, and the other, the other thing that um, I was doing, which again anyone can do, I created a group called Roast Chicken Writers Club, and on a Sunday, about every other month, 12 writers would come to my house, and we would write together while I roasted a chicken. And then, you know, the two hours were up, we would open the wine and have dinner together and talk about publishing. And those are really easy things that I think anyone can do to create their own writing communities. I was really rooting for you to say, and then I kicked them all out and ate the chicken myself. <laughs> that would have been great. Grant, what about either of you? I'll just talk about, you know, I, I feel like I've got a, a, a really strange sort of like writing communities that I'm involved of, largely because of the work I do. So it's hard to define what's a work community versus a personal community. They really blur together so much, and that's because NaNoWriMo is a community, and it's this huge community of 500,000 writers you know, around the world. And then within that big community, there's so many other little spheres and connecting circles and Venn diagrams. And then the same thing happens like when I'm with 100 Word Story, which is very different. You know, it's a literary journal, but there are different kind of spheres of community there, like the whole flash fiction community, and then 100 Word Story, all the writers there. So in the course of like a day, a typical day, I might interact with like 20 or 25 different communities if I was really gonna do like a kind of like listing of them. And that, that's wonderful. Um, but I think what's more interesting to me and what I think might be more interesting to you is, is like the value of what these communities provide and what I see as like the, the, the foundational 
necessity to get those experiences that Rebecca mentioned, like sharing actively and trusting that you're going to get like meaningful feedback is amazing. And meeting with people as, you know, surveillance partners, accountability partners, like that's high degree of trust goes into that and emotion. And so I've been thinking a lot about this and I think, I, when I think of a book, I think it's a big cauldron of different ingredients. And we usually think of things like inspiration and imagination and grit and determination and playfulness and all these, all these things are in this pot that's being stirred around. But the only way that any of these things kind of add up to a novel is with a sense of belonging, you know, to be vulnerable, to risk uh, a daring joke or a daring comment, you have to feel a sense of belonging, you know, either to your active in-person community or to the larger world, I think. And so that's what, at NaNoWriMo, like the shorthand is, is that we say your story matters. Like we are fundamentally about helping people feel that they belong enough to the world to risk putting their imagination and their story into it. And I think that that's the foundational part of any community. So that's what I look for in communities that I'm involved with. I'm gonna say one tiny little thing because I started out with NaNoWriMo and the thing that, uh, that NaNoWriMo gave me, which I think a lot of people can relate to is permission. Because if a whole bunch of other people are doing the same thing that you're doing, you have permission to be doing nothing but that. Whereas if you are at home alone, or in my case with you know, my children and my husband and my dogs, they all have needs, there's always stuff to do. And it's really easy to distract yourself and go off and you know, finish the laundry, get started on dinner, whatever. Um, but when you're the only person in the room not writing, then you feel like the jerk that's not writing. So don't be that jerk, get with the program and everybody can be writing at the same time and you'll have permission from the group. Um, I, belonged, I belong to several literary communities on and offline um, as COVID forced us have, uh, to be offline. Uh, I wanna talk about, initially about three. Um, one is the Writer's Grotto in San Francisco an organization that was largely, overwhelmingly, undeniably white as white can be uh, when I got there and um, did what I decided to do when I'm in those environments, is not be a victim, but say, okay, let's organize ourselves and our resources and start creating our own space. So we created something called Rooted and Written, where we asked every non-white member of the Grotto, an organization of 150 approximately at the time, and um, we had about 40 non-white writers who were scattered and largely marginalized, like non-white, many non-white writers, especially particular groups, are marginalized within the larger definitions of the literary and of community, literary community. So, um, and then there's a whole working class writer thing that. I can talk about too, but so we created Rooted and Written, and it was a, you know we also had white allies because when you start these initiatives, you start realizing some people are much more apt to support and do solidarity with you than others. And I'm happy to report that some of those others, many of those others, are now gone from the grotto, and that the grotto is a I think a far happier organization and more transparently honest about issues like racism and sexism and things in the organization. So I'm happy to have been, a, I think, a, a part of that, along with the, some of the people in the room. Uh, the other effort is uh, more externally community. I don't define community solely in MFA terms. I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone here, but I just don't do MFA speak that well. Um, I think, you know, having lived in Latin America and been a part of literary community there, it's always, literary and community have always been in what we would call crisis. Kind of like what this country is looking like now, which this country has never had to face it. And so I think the ideas of the literary and the community have to confront the fact of crisis in the United States, a country in extreme decline right now, that you know, if we don't do that, then our community becomes, quite frankly, a fucking bubble that 
kind of protects us from crisis that we need to confront. So that leads to my third community, which is an uh, informal community of leftists and Latinx writers, two groups that are not literary in the traditional sense, because none of y'all can name five Latino writers off the top of your head, except maybe one of you here. Not a one of you can do that off the top of your head. So either Latinos are genetically modified not to be able to write, or there's a real disease at the heart of literature in the United States with respect to people defined as Latinx and Latino. Now, I've met people who really literally believe that we're genetically modified to be incapable of writing. And we've created community, literary community, that has completely erased Latinx peoples in a state like California. So I'll start there and... <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so when you first joined a writing community where, you know, way back in the dim and distant past of your, of your life. What were you looking for and how has that changed over time? You can hear the gears grinding. You know, uh, when I first put a book, because I, I was an actress for a long time, I was a screenwriter, and then I put a book, my first book on Wattpad, and it really was just I just wanted people to read it. Honestly, I think I was in the same position as a lot of people where I had written a book. I was really proud of it. I thought it was good. Didn't really know what to do with it. Sent it to some agents. Heard nothing back. And I was like, I just want people to read this. It's for young people. And I thought a friend of mine had mentioned that her, his daughter read everything on Wattpad. And I thought, I'm going to stick my book on there and see if I can find a community of young people who want to read it and who might have some things to say about it. Did not know at the time that, at the time, there was no such thing as a publishing house. They, they hadn't started it yet. So um, it won an award on the site, which was very exciting. And I was like, yeah, I won an award. And then they called me and they said, you know, we actually started this publishing imprint last year. So we want to publish it. It was a one book deal at the time. It became a three book deal and it became, you know, they also had started a production company. So now it's, it's part of all of that. But um, the goal was to find readers. The goal was, is there a way to reach out to a community online which doesn't require a lot of gatekeeping? It's really hard, as I'm sure everyone knows, to, to have permission to put your words out there. And I think that's a lot of what we're talking about is how do you get past someone giving you permission or permission to tell your story or a story that is important to you whether it's a personal story, whether it's about something that's from your life, whether it's something you just totally made up, um, how do you get to a point where there's a community that you can reach out to and that you can be a part of and you can read their things? And when I discovered Wattpad, it really was just this like, oh, thank God I found this community. And a lot of them are young. There's a lot of really young writers, um, like teenagers on this site. So my first thought was, oh gosh, am I, are they even going to care what I have to say? I'm older than them. So it was this wonderful thrill of finding uh, this community. And then it, by complete dumb luck, it le led to these other opportunities. But I really, at the time, like, when I got the publishing deal, I said, you know what, even if it had just been finding the readers and being able to experience other people's writing, that would have been enough. And now it's more. So every day I just... I focus on the gratitude of that, and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm so grateful that it's led to so many opportunities, and it's leading to more and more as we go. So yeah, I got lucky there. I had no writing community at all when I wrote my first two books. Um, I was really alone when I, I did them. Um, and then when I started my third book, um, I had an opportunity to join the Writer's Grotto. Um, so I went there looking for company. I mean, I was basically just lonely as a writer and I wanted to be around other writers. What I found was a lot more support. Um, I found my, my new agent uh, from a colleague at the Writer's Grotto. Um, I also, there's something in there part of an organization and whenever somebody there would sell a book, There'd be champagne, and we would toast them. And just knowing that it was possible to sell a book, because we would see it happen before our eyes, was hugely motivating to me. So I'm very grateful for my experience there. But I remembered how, on those first books, I had no community, which is why uh, with Lit Camp and with 
Page Street, our co-working space, um, I wanted it to be open to people who had not published. You know, or as I like to say, not yet published, but people who were community-minded and serious about their writing. Because I think once we publish, it's actually easier to meet other writers. We sit on panels like this, we go to festivals. But when you're first starting out and when I think you really need the support, there's not enough out there for you. Um, so I think that that's really critical. Yeah, thank you um, for mentioning the Grotto. Um, an organization that I've been critical of, but I, that I love. I've given a lot myself and it's given a lot to me. My book wouldn't have been possible without help getting agents, without critique of my work, without, you know, uh, just somebody to say, damn, man, I gave my editor 145,000 words when I was only supposed to give her 80,000. <laughs> Fuck. So, you know, a lot of uh, debt that I have to the Grotto, in addition to critique, because that's the highest part of love, is to be honest, right? I think, uh, and transparent. So, um, early, the question is about the earliest. Mm -hmm. Earliest, I grew up in San Francisco, my, the Mission Public Library, and, you know, we had community there reading books together. We stole books together, too, because I was, <laughs> they're, I'm actually going to get, they're going to, uh, they bought like hundreds of my book in the library, and they're going to do some gala honor, honoring me and whatnot, and I'm going to have to fess up at this event, to <laughs> having stolen with my friend Freddie Weinstein the entire set of the Danny Dunn sci-fi adventure series. Okay, so, so everyone read that thing and steal a copy of his book. Steal a book of mine and your balance my karma. So I'm um, very Californian as you hear. So but my, my 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 first sense of like adult literary community really was in Latin America in El Salvador. And I, I mention this not just to bring Latin America into it, but because um, I think we're in a country that's starting to resemble Latin America in terms of say the division between rich and poor. Just look outside the door here in the August city of Berkeley that used to be home to homeless, to poor people and others who are now erased from the topography, right? Entirely erased, I grew up here. Uh, or, um, and so, uh, you know, um, in, in the U.S. is, in terms of the division between rich and poor, surpasses Latin America. In terms of, say, the judiciary system, I don't need to tell anybody here, I will hope, of the extremism that the judiciary reflects in the larger culture in terms of um, the rise of reactionary, militaristic, fascistic uh, culture and, 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 and politics, regardless of the political party in power. So Obama didn't do a damn thing to reduce a single fucking military base. And he gave the cops all those heavily armed RoboCop weapons that they, he, he, he mass produced that, along with things on immigration, don't get me started. Anyway, okay. so <laughs> um, my point is that the, the U.S. is, resembling Latin American countries. So in that sense, I think it's useful to look at ideas of community and the literary that Latin America developed way before we had to face the Latin Americanization of the United States. Because Latin America faced it in the 70s, 50s. And so under those conditions, I was there and I joined a guerrilla army. Um, my discovery of community was in the middle of war, in the middle of say clandestine hideouts where you would conduct operations by day and by night you would write poetry sometimes or in the day you would write poetry and conduct operations by night in clandestine hideouts or in guerrilla camps. So I say this because uh, the, the ideas of community don't have to be these static MFA type things. There's, it's, we, we have to adjust, I think, the lens of community and of the literary itself in a country that has 60 million people, Latinx identified, who are being erased entirely from the literary landscape. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I think uh, I, my, my first senses of community were those. We're, we're in a context of a war and crisis, and we're in crisis, and we're in perpetual war here, so let's figure out new ways to do community and literary. No, I like that point. If, if writing is a big enough priority for you, you will build a community. You don't have to you know, wait for a cushy spot or you know, a, a bunch of time on your hands. But I do need lattes to be. <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase, adjust the lens of a community, um, because to me that also means recognizing 
your community, and I, I, I hear so many writers, I don't know, there's something about writers, it, it, it's very solitary, obviously, and so it's easy to feel like you did it all by yourself. Um, and so I think, when I hear writers say I don't have a community, or I've never had a community, I, I, I now don't believe that. Be because I used to be one of those writers. I, I was very, wrote, I, I didn't actively seek out a community, or look for that kind of MFA type of community that Roberto mentioned, and like you, Janice, like, wrote a bunch of stuff that got published and didn't have any active feedback from anybody. Um, but that said, like when I paused and reflected on it, I actually did have a community. I just wasn't recognizing it, you know? Like, like recognizing the, the teachers who I had in my life, recognizing the fellow writers, even if we weren't actively like talking about short stories together, we were getting something from each other. And I think what Lee said is that as a writer, you just kind of, even if you're the most solitary introverted writer, you're gonna have, you're gonna track something or stumble upon something and you're gonna be involved in it. And, and what I've loved with my own personal community uh, is how it's just taken on this, this momentum that's undirected by me. You know, like even today, we're like meeting new people. You know, that all has like new, you know, will bring new people and new community into my life. I went to this literary festival in Boise earlier <laughs> this year. I'd never been to Boise. Well, I have a whole new like sphere of, of people that I'm interacting with as a result. And, and I think like, like what's been mentioned here is that you can't underestimate like how much that's gonna help you in ways that you both recognize and don't recognize. Um, whether it's being introduced to agents or, um, or publishers or who knows what. Um, but also, I, I think like we really need to pause as writers and really reflect on, on how we're being made to, to feel like we belong and what kind of power that has in our creativity and our risk taking and our vulnerability on the page. And I do want to say one thing. Um, Zoetic Press operates in the teeny, teeny indie lit journal space. Uh, we put out non-binary review. And one thing that um, becomes very obvious when you are on the back end of that process, nearly every writer that submits to my journal is an editor at some other journal. And so it is that particular community, very small, very tight knit, everyone kind of knows each other, but also really welcoming and really easy to break into. Um, you know, there are so many tiny, tiny little indie lit journals that are looking for the story that you're telling. And you know, once, once you get in there, you have opened the door to a huge community of indie lit publishers that you know, all know each other. Also, you know, a lot of indie lit publishers are looking for staff, looking for people who will you know, read and vote on submissions and help them curate their, their um, journals. And that is another great way to create a fabulous community. So okay, um, gonna take it down a second here. What are some of the downsides of community? And do you think that there are people who are better off going it alone? I want Rebecca to start, I really do. Fight for it, fight for it. I never think about that. I, I, I never think about the downsides, and I think it's because writing is so isolating. Um, I know my kids, were, my kids were babies when I wrote the first book. I was writing alone in a cafe, wrote the second book alone at the kitchen table, wrote the third book crying in my car because it was COVID and there was nowhere else to go. Uh, alone in the car, waiting for my daughter to get out of ballet. I, I don't know that there's a downside to community. I think in every, and when I was acting, when I was screenwriting, Everything is about finding people who believe in you and who you can believe in. I, I really think that that's that life and writing is, is finding your people. It's so hard to do these things by yourself. It is so hard to feel like you're screaming into a void. It is so hard to write these books and not know if, if, you're gonna, if anyone's ever going to read it, if anyone's ever going to care. We've all been there. We've all been sitting in front of our computer going, well, this might be for nobody. <laughs> you know? um, and it's hard. It's so hard to keep going. And I, even to this day, I'm having more success than I've ever had. And there are days where I'm like, screw it. I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> Um, because it's hard and it's isolating and there are no promises. There are never promises. Even now there's no promises. Um, but 
as you start to break in, wherever you break in, whether it's a journal, I broke in with Wattpad, if you can break into the grotto, if you can find your people who, are, who believe in you and who are happy for you, that you've celebrated something, you've accomplished something, it, it opens up more circles. Like even, even now, getting invited to these panels, you get to meet other writers, you get to meet other people. And before that, we were all sitting at home with COVID. There was nowhere to go, there was so hard to meet people, but every time you can make even one connection, there's that feeling of, oh, thank God, I'm not alone, someone else is in this position, I have someone to do this with. So that's a weird, I don't know, downside of community. Like, oh God, I don't know. I have one too. Go for it, you go. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to romanticize literary communities. They are communities made up of people like every other community. And it is inevitable if your literary community gets big enough, they're people you're just not going to like. Okay, or people who annoy you in some way. So you have to decide, okay, is, is what I'm getting from this community enough to put up with that? Or is this so distracting? Or why is it that this person annoys me so much? You know, we're talking about how wonderful literary community is, and I think that it is, but I do think that it is, it's not special. It's not unlike any other community. And so I think that that's an important thing to remember. <laughs> yeah, I, I, w earlier when I was a writer, I didn't actively seek out writing groups um, after experiencing a lot of them that didn't work for me. And, and that was largely because I got to the point as a writer that I, and I'm still this way, maybe it's a fault, but I don't like to have a lot of voices in my head. I don't like to tell people about the projects or the stories I'm working on. I like to like think through them and pursue them myself. And I, I do think we're living in this age where there's where you, where you feel like everybody's getting feedback on your work and there's and you, that's what you're supposed to do as a writer is get feedback from friends and have a writing group. And I think that that works for some people and it works for some people in certain groups. And I think you have to be really um, generally pretty thoughtful and intentional about how you design that group and how it's structured to, to meet everybody's needs. Uh, but I didn't find that and I've never truly found that and I've been pretty fine with like doing it on my own Although again, this could be a fault. Maybe I'd publish 20 books by now if I had a had a good writing group I'm going very slowly. Maybe I go more slowly than many other groups uh, But I, so it's very personal. I think that the idea of community and I think I, I think really like I, again like, I forget what phrase you use Janice, but just this I don't want to glorify communities too much because I think you it's all about finding the community that works for you. And then I think like Roberta was talking about is shaping that community, you know? Like, 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 I mean, to shape a community, like the community has to be able to accept conflict, you know? Yeah. And, and how do you accept conflict? How do you, how do you go beyond that conflict to keep having the discussion and shape itself? Yeah. Thank you. I would add that the community can also engage conflict and take it on, especially at a time like this. Um, I think, you know, I make a distinction between organic community, homegrown, you know, not all these strains of literary pot that we're smoking now, but, you know, the, 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 an, an inorganic conglomerated community, as exemplified, for example, by a book called American Dirt. We were told that this book was, by Sandra Cisneros said, it was, quote, the not just the great Latin American novel, not the great American novel, but the great novel of Las Americas. Wow, Sandra Cisneros said this. And when you read the book, it's the absolute unadulterated piece of bullshit, <laughs> racist, badly written by this white woman who didn't know anything about the journey from the South to the North. Yet Oprah Winfrey then came and said, you will build community reading groups around this. We are going to make a multi-million dollar movie out of this. So we're at a time where corporate power is so great that it insinuates itself into our notions of literary community. So, um, you know, uh, I, I would argue that the antidote to that is organic community where you kind of are safe <laughs> from the the tentacles of this growing and increasingly consolidated industry that's doing to literature what, say, the Democrats and Republicans have done to politics. 
kind of being money laundering for corporate power. You know, I, I think that brings up a good point that community is going to function a little bit differently for every single writer. And finding your community um, it is something that, like, like anything else, it's like finding the perfect recipe. It's all about you. You know, the, my perfect recipe won't be your perfect recipe. So, um, yeah, so that's a tough one. So we are going to switch tracks a little bit now, and I want to talk about connecting with readership. Okay? So... My big question, because I hate Twitter with the fiery passion, uh, do writers need to be on social media to, to connect with readers? <laughs> you know, I know of so many writers who are just on Twitter, like, you know, Susan Orleans famously, you know, is on Twitter all the time. Um, and but when you're Susan Orlean, you can go on and make a really funny joke about being drunk and like, and like, exactly. I felt, oh, my thing fell off. Oh, no, it's on. And everyone will crack up and it's hysterical because you're Susan Orlean. Um, Absolutely. But then again, you can be uh, yeah. JK Rowling and completely shoot yourself in and the front. Do you should get off Twitter. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, you know, it is a double-edged sword. I loathe Twitter, well, yeah. so with the fiery, like the flames on the side of my face. I, every time, I, I just think this is not, the, I hate this. I hate everything about this. I hate who these people, I think if I met these people, I'd probably like them, but on Twitter, I hate them. I, I, I hate myself on Twitter. I hate it. <laughs> it's just, it's not my thing. I feel like we're trying so hard to be brief that we're distilling truths into things that don't speak to me. I don't, I, I hate it. Anyway, it's hard. I Look at me, I went first. I said I wasn't gonna. Um, I think it's really difficult. There, I've, I had such a good positive experience on Wattpad, meeting that community, and I think there are sites like Instagram where I'm like, this is fun, it's pictures. Who doesn't like pictures? Pictures are pretty. I kind of started TikTok, I kind of hate it, but it's fine. But there's something about Twitter that I'm just like, Ugh, I don't like it here. I don't know. I don't think you have to do everything. I really don't. I don't know that it sells books. I don't know that it builds community. And I think when you hate being somewhere, people can tell. Yeah. And then they don't want to hang out with you there either. So I rarely tweet. But I do Instagram. And you can follow me on Instagram. <laughs> Look what I did. Um, yeah, because I think I, I'm able to put positive energy out there. If you can't put positive energy out, you will not get positive energy back. That's true. And I feel like Twitter, especially, responds like if you may, if you say something sarcastic, you'll get like 80 likes. And if you say something positive, like I loved this book, one like, and it's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like Twitter like sucks up negative and then pushes negative back at you. I can't stand it. Yeah. I, I do want to make a plug for TikTok real quick though. If any of y'all owns a monkey, please get a TikTok account and let me know what it is because that's all I want to see is monkeys. Okay. I'll just add a respectful counterpoint. Uh, I don't think we need to be on every platform. I think we need, in the age of what used to be called the information age by my former professor there at Berkeley, uh, Manuel Castells wrote a great book, The Network Age. Um, we need, I mean, the fact is if politically you're not online, you don't exist. That's just a fact at this stage uh, in terms of scale. The scales of readerships that are being built by these conglomerates astonishing. So most of us don't matter in the scheme of the writing pyramid. The only people that mostly they care about are the people at the top of the pyramid, the Roxanne Gays, Barack Obama, you know, uh, eventually Mitch McConnell when he's about to die. Um, so, um, you know, you, you but I, I think you do have to have some presence at this stage um, of the game of, in history unless you build some sort of an alternative network in the organic real world, you know. So uh, I, ch I, I would advise selecting one and being really good at the one. And mine is Twitter. I'm not saying I'm really good. I got, what, 10,000 followers? I don't put that much energy into it at this point. But um, I, I, I do benefit because the people that follow me are, are as my now deceased father said, is no son cualquier cinco yuca. They're not just any five cent potato. There's like a lot of editors, journalists, agents, opinion makers. So you don't have to have a million followers, just have the right ones. Have people, follow people, 
get to know people like our esteemed panelists, you know, like editors, like other writers, like journalists, like critics. And you can actually access people on Twitter in unique ways, in direct ways. So, I mean, I hate Elon Musk with a passion, but I'm not gonna get off Twitter because it's a strategic, it's one of the primary means of communication for the human race at this stage. So you can stay in, in your industrial age silo or you can embrace the fact of what people like Walter Benjamin, the great German philosopher, talked about in the book called the, um, the Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, right, where the nature of reading and writing itself changes with the changes in technology. So digital technology is changing what it means to read and what it means to write. And if you're not aware of that, you're kind of in a bubble, quite frankly. I just want to say, um, there have been a number of articles lately that talk about how being on social media does not sell books. Um, and I think that's important because publishers push us as writers to do that, I think, because they just want to give us something to do so we're not bothering them. <laughs> but what I think might be more important for this audience and the idea of community is not so much connecting with readers, but connecting with an audience. Getting to take your work out in a public way, which is why when things like The Grotto or us at Lake Camp um, and NaNoWriMo, they do live events where a lot of aspiring and new writers get to read and for the public. And I think that that's an important function of community as well as these public readings, and we, you know, when we look at things like the book festival here, but also like Lake Quake and the Lake Crawl, it is a way for everyone to start to create an audience. And I think that that is more relevant, to, you know, relevant in a way to, to you guys here. Yeah, I'll riff on that too. I think, um, I think it's really hard to sell a book on Twitter. I don't think that it, many of my tweets have really inspired people to buy a book. And that's, that's not really my primary reason for being on social media. And I think it is very rare these days for a writer not to be on social media or who has that kind of, I guess, privilege. Um, but, but that said, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's morphed in different stages of my own writing. But, but recently, it, it's not about having thousands of followers or something. It's about a connection with individual readers, you know. And, and one of the things I find interesting about being a writer is that a lot of people think that, you know, the more accomplished you get, the kind of easier it is to put your writing out into the world. But I find that it's just almost equally scary each time. You just, you're making yourself vulnerable. You don't know what people's response is going to be. Um, and and you're, 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 you're risking essentially rejection or ostracization in some way. And so it's really meaningful to me when somebody just leaves a feedback. Like I just started this newsletter on Substack and I'm experimenting with it. Yeah. And, and when somebody like writes me something that they actually got from that one single newsletter and they say it was meaningful to them, I mean, that, that fuels me. I don't need book sales. Like that's, that's enough. That, that is the currency. That's the payment. You know, that's what makes it worth it. I just want to add one thing about um, the question of the social media sell books. No, alone it won't. But social media is part of the marketing ecology that does sell books. So that your name is out there, your book's name is out there. And so whether it's in the street, at a bookstore, in interviews, in the media, and on social media, the, 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 the web of different parts of the ecology are what sells books. That gets your name out there. Because, you know, you're not, you've got to get your name out there. Everything is marketing, you know, even if you post a video and 200 people see it, that's 200 people who know you exist, you know, even if they don't buy the book. That's true. Okay, last question, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, uh, what kind of relationship do you ideally want to have with readers? And I don't mean like the general what kind of relationship does a writer want to have with their readers. I mean you personally. What kind of relationship are you looking for with your readers? I felt like I was forcing Rebecca to start again. <laughs> it's a luxury. I'll just answer shortly. I mean, it's just what I described. I mean, I mean, getting a meaningful response. Somebody actually read something you wrote 
and thought about it and it, and it affected them in some way and, and that we have a conversation about that. I mean, I think fundamentally the reason we uh, write and read is to connect with the human experience and there's so many different ways to do that and so it's just, I'm just so touched when somebody actually, that we find a connection in something I wrote and put in the world and vice versa. Yeah, can't say it any better than that. Yeah. It's just such an honor when someone says, I read your book and I really liked it. You're like, you read my book? <laughs> you know? And I realized like, it's published and that was the whole idea is you people read it, but it's still to this day people are like, when someone writes to me or tags me or writes to me on either on Wattpad or just you know, on social media and says, I really loved this book, and I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's really, it's the best feeling, it is. Well, um. My father just died. This was dedicated to my father. So I feel uh, he's a central character in the book and in my life. And um, I would be moved if people would read all the love that I put into my father's life. And to tell him, um, I think uh, that, because writing is a lonely endeavor. Um, being a Latinx person in the United States and it's an extremely lonely endeavor because there's 60 million of us and this country could give a flying shit about us and are dead and are living. And it's lonely as a leftist because it's a, I think the country assumes that leftists can't write. That's not true, it's just leftists are erased from the capitalist order of literature right now in the United States. Things are that extreme because you don't see a lot of seriously leftist writers on the shelves right now. I asked an agent when I was interviewing agents who wanted to represent me. I said, who's your idea of a leftist writer? You know what she said? ta Coates. I'm like, what the fuck? Give me a break. The dude calls himself bougie. He's a multimillionaire. And that's your idea of a leftist writer? God damn. So um, anyway, I... So who's I, the audience you're looking for? The audience is people that also feel alone and don't want to feel as alone in the story of your parent, in the story of your family, in the story of your community, in the story of the crisis that you're facing in the world right now. That's what I want. And I also want to organize, because I'm not a victim. I can't read Grant. I okay. would love to hear these questions. All right, yeah. So uh, it is now time for questions. So if you have a question, um, please head over to, I am assuming, this person, this lovely person in the bandana. Um, who will hold the microphone. He will be the holder of the talking stick. Um, and please ask a question rather than making a comment and speak directly into the microphone so that the, uh, the recorded thing will, will show up. So, anyone, anyone, um, everyone? Yeah, I'm just gonna... um, can you talk about online versus uh, in-person community, where it's going sort of post-pandemic? Are you members of communities that you would say are only online? What's the role of in-person community going forward? Um, I, I can speak to that a bit because I run to one online exclusive community and then a more in-person one. Um, so Creative Caffeine Daily is an online community. It works, um, I think, a lot for people who are not all in the same space. Uh, it's a community where you remember you get a prompt every day and every week you're paired with another member to exchange work and feedback. Um, and so it's, it serves a good function. We actually launched in the March of the pandemic. Um, so it's, it's been going on a little more than, than two years. I think what we learned in the pandemic was to do a hybrid model. So at LitCamp, to keep our community connected, we started this virtual writing for our whole community, which is about 2,000 people. Now, they didn't all turn up, but we still do it. Three times a month, we host virtual writing where people will sign on, they'll say what, in one sentence what they're going to work on, and for eight minutes, we'll write together, and then at the end, we just say, oh, what a great day, or oh, God, it was so slow today. But it is a way to do both. And I think that is one of the lessons of the pandemic, that we can do both when 
you know, convenience or distance doesn't work. They're different, for sure, these communities, but I think they're both equally supportive. Um, I want to say that at Zoetic Press, um, I've said the ND-Lit community is very small. We started in 2014, and our the community that we forged was largely on Facebook because that was the easiest way to get uh, people from all over the world. Our writers come from literally all over the world. Our staff is all over the world. Um, get them together and talking together. So we have a private Facebook group just for our authors. And because of that group, they have gotten together and they have made books together and you know, they have you know, done stuff out in the world. They've started some of their own journals um, because they met through our press. And so, at, and the people that have met and done work together don't necessarily live in the same state, in the same time zone. Um, so community online is, is not just possible, but it's made easier uh, by the fact that now you can have these sort of asynchronous communities. Um, and having, having that diversity of age and experience and geographical location and culture is, is super important to having a very rich and interesting community. But I will say that I think we've all taken the pandemic kind of for, oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the only thing I'm concerned about is I think the pandemic made a lot of people forget about the value of in-person meetings just in general. And I think, you know, we've gone through, what is it? Hundreds of thousands, millions of years of evolution. And a lot of that evolution is about being with people and working with them face to face. And so I think that we're wired with our mirror neurons, whatever's going on in our head, to have um, collaboration and creativity is enhanced through in-person reactions um, or interactions. I don't think that that necessarily happens in the same way online. Although I think online, as you guys said, does facilitate a different type of experience that's also really valuable as we've learned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you can expound more like I did. No. <laughs> okay, the lady with the flowery mask. Up here. Oh, he's, he's got it, yeah. As you're talking about community, it sounds like you're almost, there's almost sort of like two versions of community, one of which is more kind of company and one of which is more about feedback. I'm curious if you could sort of speak a little bit to sort of what each type of community means to you, if that makes sense as a distinction. You know, I saw this panel and the, the moderator asked this great question to the other writers and she said, how do you write with the door closed? And that just stuck with me because I do think when you're writing, there is some sort of just being on your own and trying to figure it out and try to write. And sometimes you just need to reach out to other people, like just because you're lonely, like just I just need other people around me. But other times it is specifically about getting feedback. And I think it's OK that we sometimes need to interact with people for various reasons. And I think during the pandemic, when we were all so isolated, there was a feeling of, I just need, even if it's people sitting on the internet, like on Zoom, not talking to me, I just need to know that they're there. Um, and then other times it's, no, I really want feedback. I actually, I need you to tell me, like, does this sentence work? Um, and I think it's okay that, that sometimes we just need human interaction. I, I know over the last two years, there have been times where I'm like, I just need someone other than my husband and kids around me to remember that, like, there's other humans. It was, it was tough to already be a writer, which is such an isolating thing, and then to not be able to go to the weekly writing group in person. So yeah, as soon as I started like getting to see other people and other writers again, it was like, oh, you're all still here, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting question and what you said, Rebecca, too, because I think, I mean, when I said earlier that I can't, I don't know how to number the communities in my life, in my writing life, you know, there's just so many overlapping Venn diagrams and I can identify different organizations and different places I've been in my life where the communities I'm part of them, but it is different to have a very specific feedback-oriented community, and um, so I, and I think that's a very different relationship. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but that's when I think, um, for me, the writing groups I've seen that have succeeded, it's when you're very intentional and you define how they're going to work and what you want from them in terms of your both your interactions and and, and the feedback, both on 
the, the group itself, because I mean, it is that thing, like, like a lot of writers, they'll, especially early in their life, they'll write a story and they'll give it to their mom or their sister or their best friend. And those people, I mean, I had a best friend who I gave it to and he didn't read it and I, 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 weeks went by and I finally went up to him and said, what did you think of that story? And he said, I'm your friend, I didn't ask to be your critic. And that was true, you know? And so that was good that he said that. And I think that's why I mean, like when you form a writing group, like think about the people you're going to be in that group with and how you want to interact with them. Do you want to be friends with them or do you want to be critic par critical partners? Do you want supportive feedback or do you want like really tough feedback? You know, there's just so many different goals that individual writers have. In NaNoWriMo, I'm, I'm really touched. We have people who get together they write just to have fun together. Just, it's like a knitting group. They just like want to be together writing and sharing stories. That's really touching, art for art's sake. It doesn't have to be published in the end to have value, right? So I just think you need to go in and understand your goals and make sure that other people in your writing group share those goals. And I also think it's like really um, good to think about like when you're getting feedback, really like asking, the, like it's tough to give feedback. So, so think about the questions you're going to ask of somebody to help guide them. Like, support your feedback partner to give you what, what is of value to them, because that makes it easier for them, too, more meaningful. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I want, just want to add one thing about communities of feedback. Be very careful who you pick to be in your community of feedback. Have criteria. Have people that have criteria, like for me, that I trust personally. Don't have some fucking diseased person in your group of intimate writing, because they're going to disease your intimate writing. Uh, I, I think people that know their game as far as reading. And, off, and then there's the criteria of critique, being able to critique and offer, and to have the ovularity or testicularity to tell the truth. Right? If you don't have that, then you're just kind of got a little fan base that you're building out of your family and friends or some shit. So, you know, um, I, I think that's important. I think there's important to have a community of accompaniment and accountability where, you know, I'm gonna get a certain number of pages done and I want you to read them by then. I would just add a third community that I think has an awesome payoff, a community of struggle in writing. Like when we did Dignidad Literaria, we challenged one of the most powerful publishing entities in the world to face the fact that it had erased Latinx peoples from the literary landscape of the United States. And we did it on Good Morning America. We shamed Oprah. We did it in the Washington Post, the New York Times, international media, throughout the land. And somebody asked me, what's the most important thing about that community effort? Was it that the piñata gave up some candy after we hit it? Yeah, that was good, because they gave up jobs, some mediocre Latinx writers are now getting six-figure deals that the rest of us aren't. Fine. But the most important part was we ourselves. Our confidence. We now know that fucking system is racist. It erases us, and we caught them. And we are not the colonized, genetically modified peoples incapable of writing that the society and the industry tells us we are. And that applies to different communities. So, okay. yeah. We got time for one more question. And I saw the, the lady at the back in the gray. Yes. Um, no. I, I've decided to attend my first like week long conference in person and I've largely done stuff online. Do you have any advice for being in person with people that you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm understanding that you said you like attended your first conference and you're looking for like a way to connect with the other people at the conference? Okay, okay, so I think the most important thing to do when you are encountering other writers is to ask them what they're working on and then actually listen to the answer and pay attention. I think that is the critical thing. And buy other people's books. Buy all your friends' books. Buy, when you go up to a writer, have their book in, in your hand because you know, they want to know that, you, that you're approaching them for, you know, from a genuine place. 
Yeah, I'll just riff on that a little bit. I think that, that is great because I mean, what Janice is talking about at the end is, is developing a connection with somebody and, and starting the relationship of trust. And I think that any community, no matter what level you're involved with them, that trust is like a foundation of so much. I think Roberto mentioned trust a few times in, in what he was talking about and getting feedback too. You know, it's really tough to give and receive feedback if that's what you're going for. And so trust, you, nothing works without it really. You know, I, I, I hear you so much because I the social anxiety, especially after COVID, I think we all kind of forgot how to talk to humans like face to face. But I'm I'm my whole life I've been astounded that when you go up to somebody and say, Hi, I'm Rebecca, it's nice to meet you, they usually say hi back. <laughs> usually. Oh like ninety-five percent of the time, and then they tell you what their name is. It's amazing. Um, the voice in my head I think will always be, they don't want to talk to me, they don't want to talk to me. And then sometimes you just have to do it anyway, and then it's pretty amazing that people very often are nice when you say hi to them, usually. That's true. All right, so um, that's it, that we have run out of time, but I wanna thank all of our lovely panelists, and I wanna thank all of you for coming out. This is our, you know, the first time the Bay Area Book Festival is being back in person, and it's because all of you are showing up, and you guys can practice your author interaction skills at the East Wind Books tent in 15 minutes, where these lovely people will be signing their books. Thank you so much.